giving you a quiz. You don't have to answer out loud, so don't be embarrassed. Um, I'm going to ask you a set of questions, uh, a, a, a set of alternatives, just quietly to yourself. Don't let anybody look at your answers. Um, just note your, uh, your thoughts, your immediate thoughts. Um, so the first question, I'm sorry, do you think you could move the boots off there? It's sort of, from a Buddhist point of view, we never put shoes on the, the shrine. Thank you, yeah. Uh, the, um, the first question is, is the world, the universe, infinite or finite in terms of space? Is there a point where the universe ends, and I suppose, therefore, another point where it ends over there, or not? Yeah? Just note your answer. <laughs> Uh, of course, then, that we're dealing with space there. I was going to write this all up, but you're probably intelligent enough to hold it in your minds. Uh, the, the second question is, of course, is the, the universe uh, infinite in time or not? Uh, was there a beginning and will there be an end or not? Yeah? Is it eternal, you could say, or is it uh, uh, temporarily finite. No doubt some of you are pretty sophisticated and already got uh, quantum physics on the go and all that. Uh, but uh, just see what your response is to those two, those two um, um, uh, questions. The third perhaps tickles the fancy of the neurologists and psychologists and so forth. But uh, is the uh, the, let's say mind, it's not really quite the right word in this context, but let's for the time being say mind, the same as the body or not? Is the, the body, are the body and mind identical or are they different? Answers just keep to yourself in the privacy of your own brain. Uh, the fourth question is is much more difficult because it already implies a certain amount of knowledge of, uh, of Buddhism, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, the, the Buddha we know is supposed to have gained enlightenment, Bodhi, and uh, he lived and walked upon this earth for uh, 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 many years after his enlightenment, but eventually he died, um, probably in his 80s. So the question is, what happened to him after he died? Uh, did he exist after he died? Uh, did he not exist after he died? And just in case you think the question is not already um, simple enough, um, did he both exist and not exist after he died? Or did he neither exist nor not exist after he died? That's just a little bit of garnish on the, uh, on the, the meal. So those are your four questions. Is the, uh, the universe uh, um, spatially finite or infinite? Is it uh, temporally finite or infinite? Is the, the, uh, the mind uh, identical with the body or is it different? And uh, does the Buddha exist after death or not or both or neither? Um, the quadrilemma, it's called, and um, how they managed to get a Greek term for a, uh, an Indian um, logical uh, system, I don't know. So I'm sure that everybody's got some response to all those questions, and probably, uh, given that many of you are probably quite educated and uh, <coughs> maybe studied, uh, you'll have responses from the point of view of science, from the point of view of philosophy, and so on. This question was, these questions were put to the Buddha uh, 2,500 years and more ago. He was approached by a wanderer uh, who went by the name of Vachagotta, or in Sanskrit Vachagotra. Um, Gotra means clan, and Vacha was one particular clan. So really his, his name was Vachasan, or Ovacha, 
or Macvatcher, depending which part of these islands he came from, or Upvatcher, indeed, if he came from Wales. Um, yeah, we're given nothing more than his surname, if you like. But he crops up again and again in the, in the Buddhist scriptures, and he's clearly of a, of a very thoughtful uh, mind. And he, he questions the Buddha again and again and again. And you can sort of trace almost uh, an intellectual history or spiritual history of Vachagotta uh, when you look at all the, the, uh, the discourses in which he appears. Because gradually the penny is dropping. He's gradually getting it. And uh, he starts off by addressing the Buddha as Bo Gotama. Uh, Bo is a, a sort of rather slightly over familiar but reasonably honorific way of, of, of talking to somebody. Um, I don't know what our, our equivalent would be because we don't have any of these formalities left anymore. It's just hi and there we go. Um, I suppose it'd be uh, Mr. maybe, Mr. 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 Gotama. Um, but as the, the process uh, continues over, the, the, uh, over many years, apparently, he ended up, of course, going for refuge to the Buddha, uh, becoming um, a, a bhikshu, uh, a monk, and uh, well, gaining enlightenment, becoming an arahant. Anyway, very early on in his, uh, his inquiry, um, he, uh, he, he came across the Buddha and asked him these four questions. He was, as I say, a wanderer. India at that time supported a large class of uh, mendicants, people who wandered um, from many different um, uh, points of view, if you like, uh, religious and philosophical or nothing. Uh, and uh, the, the, uh, the belief system of the time suggested that if you supported such people, you got benefit. So uh, a quite large class of, um, of, of uh, mendicant, uh, uh, mendicant men and, and women wandered in the jungle, uh, came to the ta ta towns and villages, begged for food, and uh, moved on. Some of them seem to have been absolute wastrels, um, from what you see in the scriptures. Uh, some of them... Uh, were highly committed to a particular point of view, and some of them were clearly on a quest. And Vachagotta was of this kind. He was on a quest. And uh, as I say, he had quite a, a, um, a sophisticated uh, inquiry. So he comes to the Buddha and he asks him, him these questions, and boy, does he get a strange answer. Because the Buddha says to him, um, when he asks, is the world infinite, he says, uh, I don't say that. And he said, well, is it finite? He said, I don't say that either. Poor Vajigata, you feel really sorry for him. Uh, the Buddha's, in a sort, certain sort of way, refusing to accept the horns of the dilemma upon which Vajigata is trying to impale him, upon which we're all impaled. Uh, if you're not, if the world is not infinite, it must be finite. If it's not finite, it must be infinite. But he says, no, neither of those apply. The same is the world uh, um, finite in terms of time or not. Uh, again, the Buddha says, neither of those apply. I do not say either of these. And then is the, uh, the, the um, I called it mind earlier, the, the word in Pali is jiva or jivang, um, which means really something more like life force. Uh, jiva in, in modern Indian languages, North Indian languages, means life. Um, and uh, it, it here in, in Buddhist scriptures often means that the sort of vital element within one, uh, that which makes one alive, that which animates. Um, so mind is a, a fairly good paraphrase in terms of our own experience. Perhaps it doesn't matter too much. It's usually translated as soul, but that, frankly, is too tendentious and takes us into particular religious views. Um, but is the, 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 the living experience, being alive, the sense of being alive, the same as the body or not? Again, the Buddha says, sorry, I don't buy either of those alternatives. Poor Vachagotta by this time. The scriptures are very, very spare 
uh, uh, but one imagines, I can't help imagining by this time, that Vachagotta, if he has any hair, and he was a wanderer, so he probably cut it off, is tearing it out. Um, come on, man, you know, it's got to be one or the other. Uh, but uh, the Buddha just won't accept either. Uh, he puts it in terms of, I do not say so. I do not say so. So again, for these four alternatives for whether the Buddha exists after death or not, again, he, he, he just won't accept any of them. It's not that the Buddha uh, exists after death. or he, you ca he does not say that the Buddha exists after death. He does not say that the Buddha does not exist after death. He doesn't say that the Buddha both exists and doesn't exist, because that could be a, a good answer, if you see what I mean. Well, you know, from a certain point of view, he exists, and from another point of view, he doesn't. No, I don't accept either of those, or uh, I don't accept that. Uh, and I certainly don't accept that he, he uh, both uh, he does. He neither exists. <laughs> What's the other thing? <laughs> Nor doesn't exist. I've got tripped up on my own triple negatives. Um, so that you got to says, come on, you know, you've got to accept one or other of these. Uh, why do you not accept them? So the Buddha says uh, they are all. Uh, the, the word is drishti or ditti in Pali. Uh, they are all what's usually translated as speculative opinions. Uh, they're all theories. Um, um, and uh, they're not just theories. They're a, a thicket of theories, a wasteland of theories, a tangle of theories, uh, a desert of theories. Um, in other words, I'm not very keen on them. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, um, therefore, I, I, I can't accept any of them. So we need to pause a little moment to just understand what we mean by a, a, a ditti or drishti, um, the, the, uh, the therefore view or speculative opinion. Uh, the word drishti um, comes from a, a, a root meaning to see. Um, again, you get it in... In, in modern Indian languages, uh, uh, darshana, darshana shastra means philosophy in modern Indian languages. Um, it's interesting amongst, I've just been with Roma people in northern Hungary, some of whom speak a language that's very similar, for instance, to modern Hindi, Gujarati and so forth. And they have a word that corresponds to drishti. Um, uh, so it just means seeing. Uh, but of clearly here, it's, uh, uh, it's not seeing in the literal sense. If you like, it's a point of view. Um, you know, I'm looking here at you, and you're looking there at me. So I'm looking from a point of view, you're looking from another point of view. If I go up on the ceiling and look down on you, I'll have a different point of view. So uh, it, it comes to mean a, 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 a sort of orientation of interpretation, a way of seeing things uh, from a particular point of view, not merely in a spatio-temporal sense, but in a, an interpretive sense. Um, so uh, if I was a, um, uh, a, a Marxist-Leninist, I'd look out over this room and see the, the, the whole lot of bourgeois, um, etc. Um, <laughs> if I was of, of, of the, theistic nature, I'd see a whole lot of people on the way to hell, um, <laughs> uh, etc. If I was a, a, a thoroughgoing materialist, I'd see a whole lot of people just really wasting their time in, um, in idle speculations, uh, and so on. Of course, we don't see it like that. <laughs> but actually, all the time, we see things from a, a certain point of view. We interpret our experience. And um, our interpretation is built upon our experience, if you see what I mean. So when I talk about, is the world finite or infinite, um, what I'm doing is taking my experience of endings, if you see what I mean. So in, in spatial terms, I'm taking my experience of going to the door there and coming to the end of this room and going out. 
um, when I'm talking temporarily, um, I'm talking about my experience of, for instance, uh, which is no doubt something you're looking forward to, this talk ending, if you see what I mean. It, you, you experience uh, boundaries, you experience ends in space and time, uh, which is useful, uh, particularly if you want to get out, if you want to uh, uh, see what to do next. Um, it, it sort of works, of course, we're later going to have to rather deconstruct this. But uh, we do have an experience of things ending spatially and things ending temporarily. But uh, a speculative view is built upon that. So we start to speculate about time and space themselves as if space was a room and as if time was a, 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 um, a, an interval between uh, a beginning and an end, if you see what I mean. So we extrapolate uh, from our rather more immediate experience, it's not absolutely immediate experience, but our common sense construction of time, we construct a, a larger notion about space and time themselves. Actually, you never experience space. You never experience the world. Uh, you never experience time. You experience uh, uh, um, duration of one um, element against another. You experience uh, the, the relationship of one thing to another. But you never experience space itself or time itself. So you're applying to space and time something that's derived from your experience within space and time, if you see what I mean. The Kantians amongst you will imme at le immediately have recognised uh, some of his discussion of the antinomies of reason. He explores exactly the same area, and uh, some have said the, uh, the discourse with Vachagotta is the sort of point at which uh, Western philosophy and, and uh, uh, Buddhism really begin to meet, be that as it may. Uh, I hope you've understood what I'm saying, that the speculative view takes from our immediate experience and uh, applies it to the very container of our experience, as if it was something within experience. Kant described this as um, having ideas that are too big for our mind. Didn't exactly use those words. Uh, so we take something from within our experience and we apply it to the whole of experience. And uh, what it does, uh, Kant explored this extensively, is it, uh, it leads to uh, implicit contradictions. I'm not going to do this now because I, you know, I just don't have time. Actually, I'm not quite clever enough. Um, but if you begin to assert either of these oppositions, uh, later Buddhism does explore this, you find that they don't work. And of course, in, uh, in uh, modern physics, um, both time and space are explored to their limits. Uh, so, um, and again, I'm only quoting what I've been told by uh, people who know much more than me, like Nyanavacha. Um, quantum physics uh, really begins to explode the uh, common sense notions of space and time and shows that in order to make them work, you have to build... Um, uh, um, models that are really contrary to common sense like multiple universes and uh, 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 many dimensions and so <coughs> forth which really are quite unthinkable they're only highly abstract extrapolations so a speculative view is a view that's derived from our ordinary common sense experience and uh, uh, exploded <coughs> way beyond its, uh, its uh, capacity to yield um, uh, um, un un unproblematic truth, if you see what I mean. So the Buddha said that uh, yeah, space and time themselves, if thought of as wholes, um, lead to problems. <coughs> um, he didn't say, he didn't describe what he meant by that. He simply said these are speculative views. He, he, he wasn't at this point particularly interested in proving or disproving it. Later Buddhism becomes more interested in 
in taking us through the thinking that shows why this is the case. We may be able to get into this a bit later. Um, he simply said, thinking in those terms, in terms of space as a, a thing, so to speak, that can therefore be infinite or finite, is uh, going way beyond your intellectual remit. It's going way beyond what thinking can do. And the same with time. Does the same with, with, with um, um, uh, the, 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 the jiva, uh, the, the life force, the, the sense of being alive, and the body. Uh, and he, uh, he again argues that to uh, speculate about their relationship is to accept uh, naively a distinction between them, if you see what I mean. Which isn't to say that they're not different. Um, because uh, the way I think of this is that we have an experience of the, of the body uh, through our own, our own senses. I can touch my body, I can see my body, I can feel my body in movement. Um, so I have a sort of external experience of my body, uh, if, if, if you see what I mean. In, in a way, the same way as I have an external experience of your bodies. But also I have an internal experience of my body. I have an experience of being embodied. I have an experience of being alive. Um, but when I separate out these two kinds of experience, I have a problem of how to relate them. And that problem is a problem in thought and therefore has to be resolved uh, in thought. And when it's resolved in thought, it leads simply to further problems. It's a speculative opinion. Um, the, the final problem that he, he was posed by Vajragata that he, 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 he said any answer to was a speculative one uh, was the, uh, what happened to the Buddha, especially after death. Of course, it's significant that he's talking about what, the, what happened to the Buddha after death because uh, the Buddha would have asserted that uh, for anybody else, well, another life would arise that after death there would be a, uh, a re-becoming, again becoming. Punabhava is the, the Buddhist uh, uh, phrase for this, not reincarnation, because that literally means something is uh, inserted again into flesh. Kane, um, flesh. Um, that's not the Buddhist perspective, that there's something that comes out of the body and then goes back into another body. It's that independence on one life another life arises. Uh, um, not to put too fine a point upon it. So uh, the, 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 the significance of Vajragata's question is that in the case of the Buddha, there is no again becoming. That's clear. The Buddha made that quite clear. There's no again becoming. So what happens? What happens when somebody gives up all clinging, uh, understands the nature of reality as it is, and dies. Um, well, and the, but the, the Buddha simply says, you can't think about it. You can't provide a satisfactory answer in thought. Any of the thoughts that you give to what happens will be wrong. Uh, they'll be one-sided. They'll only get part of it. They won't get the whole thing. Um, Poor Vachagotta. One feels really sorry for him. Um, he has another go, and he says, yeah, but what about any... Are you saying that anybody, not just the Buddha, who gains liberation, who gains Bodhi, who awakens, uh, you can't say what happens to him when he dies? Uh, so the Buddha said, yes, I'm not, not saying that he exists after death. I'm not saying that he doesn't exist after death. I'm not saying that he both exists and doesn't exist nor am I saying that he neither exists nor doesn't exist. Got it. Uh, <laughs> he's uh, he's uh, um, saying that none of these catch what's going on. Well, uh, why? What, what's he getting at? Why can't he answer? For goodness sake, these are straightforward questions. Does it go on forever or does it stop? Uh, has it been going on for, since begin, the beginningless time, or was there a, a starting point? 
uh, and so on. Um, and, uh, you know, either the, 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 the mind is uh, located in the body or the body in the mind or, uh, or not, uh, or they're separate, or, uh, you know, either the Buddha exists after death or doesn't exist, or maybe there's some sort of rather subtle uh, blending of the two or not. Um, but the Buddha says all of these are speculative opinions built out of the abstraction from our direct experience. We take our direct experience, we break it up into manageable bytes, concepts, uh, which allow us to manipulate our experience. Very, very useful. If without them, I would be dumb and uh, you would be deaf. Um, I'd have nothing to say, you'd have nothing to understand. So I, we extrapolate from our direct sensory experience concepts which are make our experience uh, portable, if you see what I mean. We transport our experience in generalizations, abstractions, uh, that we can then build uh, um, conceptual uh, st structures out of that enable us to, to, to remember what we happened in the past, plan for the future, and communicate with each other. Uh, all that I've said so far is based upon abstractions, words, concepts underlying the words, that are derived from direct experience, and that, if I'm doing my job properly, ultimately refer back to direct experience. But uh, they're abstractions. They're already a movement away. Even a notion like table is a movement away from the, uh, uh, the direct experience of, 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 of this, uh, well, I was going to say object, but even object is a highly abstract term, uh, of this. Um, whether you can see it or not, there's a table here. <laughs> but you see, you know what I mean, because you've transported the notion of table, and it's got some sort of uh, uh, portability that you can then reapply. Which is great, it's fine, as long as you know what you're doing. As long as you know that you're, uh, you're, you're taking direct experience, uh, abstracting it for particular purposes, and then reading it back into direct experience. Uh, you know, so I, I, I can time this talk, I can, I'm not very good at it actually, but I can, I can work out how long I need to speak uh, from because I've abstracted the notion of, of, uh, of an hour, uh, a unit of time, and I'm measuring what I'm saying against that. But it's an abstraction. What actually is happening is, is right now. I'm able to sustain an argument more or less, uh, because I'm able to uh, uh, transport what I've already said, apply it in the present, and carry it forward into the future. You're able to understand me to the degree that you can, because you're doing the same thing in reverse. And all the time, I'm uh, subliminally uh, drawing on my direct experience. All the time, you're tran translating what I'm saying into your own experience, I hope. If, of course, if you've lost me, what's happened is you're not able to do that. You've missed a, a, a step in the argument somewhere, or you're, you've gone off somewhere, so you're not able to bring it back into your own experience. So, um, that's fine, as long as you know what you're doing. As long as you're aware that what you're dealing with is uh, concepts, uh, uh, ab abstractions, generalizations, uh, which do not have any reality. Uh, they don't exist. Um, this is not anything very sophisticated or complex. This is very basic. Uh, but what happens is we mistake our concepts and even our words for reality. And we start to think that when we're thinking about our concepts and abstractions that we're producing something real, if you see what I mean. So we've got this experience of ending which is a real experience. I come to the end of the room and I bump into the wall. It's an end, a terminus, uh, a boundary, uh, um, uh, a finitus, an ending. Um, and uh, so I then apply that you know, useful 
uh, abstraction from my experience of coming to the end to everything. And actually even everything is a ridiculous overgeneralization because you can never experience an everything, if you see what I mean. It's, it's a notion that comes from our experience of dividing our experience up <laughs> into discrete things and then thinking of the sum of all things. The sum of all, all things never exists, if you see what I mean. It only exists in thought. If you uh, uh, think otherwise, bring show, um, if you see what I mean. It's, it's, uh, it's a slight of thought. The world or the universe is no doubt in, in, uh, in physics, cosmology and so forth is a, is a defined term. But in general usage, it's, uh, it's the abstraction of, of abstractions of space and time. Uh, and when we start to speculate upon these, uh, these abstractions, we end up with trouble. Um, we'll come back to all this, I hope, but I hope you, you're, you're with me so far. What the Buddha is saying is that uh, these questions arise from a failure to really understand what you're doing when you're asking these questions uh, and uh, taking your, your thoughts too seriously, if you sort of mean. It's, it's a bit like in, in some situations uh, I've, I've experienced saying something like, well, you know, everything is impermanent. And somebody will say, ah, yes, but what about impermanence? Do you see what I mean? You've taken an abstraction, uh, a way of, 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 of indicating uh, 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 something that when applied to experience is true. And you think of that, that thing, that abstraction, as itself a thing. And then that, that, that abstraction and uh, its, um, its falsification in terms of a thing denies the term itself. It's very difficult to explain if people haven't got a reasonable degree of... Um, a sort of uh, sophistication with concepts. Um, so the Buddha is basically saying you can't think uh, about things in these terms. And uh, especially you cannot think about me after I'm dead in these terms. Uh, so in what terms can we think uh, about the Buddha? In what terms can we think even about our experience? Um, but what, what uh, the, the, the Buddha is, is, uh, is really indicating, is pointing to, is the fact that things are not as they seem to, to us to be. We've already constructed our experience in such a way that when we start to uh, extrapolate from it, we end up with absurdity. But we've already accepted a, a sort of falsification. In a sense, you could say, simply to experience is to falsify. Uh, because uh, it seems to us, by uh, what um, um, the, the, the great German philosopher Schopenhauer called the original disposition of the mind, uh, we're disposed to think that there is out there a real solid independent world that's independent of the moment of experience. That the moment of experience is uh, a flash, a, a moment of seeing something that exists independently of the moment of experience. Huh? And, and similarly, uh, we, the, the original disposition of the mind, the way in which experience is given to us, uh, is prepackaged with the assumption that I am having the experience. There is an I who stands behind, independent of uh, experience, having experience. So it's as if there's a world that is experience, but in it exists independent of the experience. And there's uh, uh, an I uh, that owns the experience and that exists independent of the moment of experience. That, that's natural. It's, it's, it's built in. And it, in a way, you could say it's extremely useful. It, 
it, it makes it possible to experience. We need to assume, uh, we need to interpret <coughs> the external dimension of our experience in terms of a, a unity of, um, of object, if you see what I mean. It all needs to belong to a single unity. So that, you know, now my experience is related to now my experience. So that, because if, if all my experience was discrete, my experience of this room now would have no relation to my experience of this room now, if you see what I mean. I have to assume that there's some endurance uh, of the object uh, um, in space and time independent of my experience of it. So when I turn my back, it's still there. I, I heard uh, uh, recently an anecdote about the uh, Engli English linguistic philosopher A.J. Ayer, that towards the end of his life he became rather eccentric and he was found, he was caught on occasions trying to jump into empty rooms to see whether they were there when he wasn't. <laughs> Needless to say, he failed. <laughs> um, um, but it's, it's in a way, it's, a, it's an enterprise worth engaging in. I'm afraid it won't succeed because <laughs> you're unfortunately there whenever you get there when it wasn't there, if you see what I mean. <laughs> but do you see what I mean? We, we, we naturally string our experience of uh, the objective dimension uh, together in a single moment of apperception. Um, we... we we um, uh, assume that this moment relate of, of, of uh, objective experience relates to previous moments of objective experience, which all belong to a single stable uh, universe, which is yeah, not entirely stable. It shifts and changes, and, but it it's changes in an orderly way, um, a predictable way, uh, independent of, of my, uh, my perceiving it. Of course, it works, doesn't it? Um, otherwise, how on earth did you get here? Um, how on earth do I keep going, um, speaking right now? How on earth do you continue to listen? Uh, there must be an assumption of continuity in the ob object, independent of the, uh, uh, of the, the experiencing moment. But notice the word assumption. Uh, it's an assumption, a very useful, um, very uh, effective for, for practical purposes, assumption. Similarly, I have to uh, uh, assume a unity of the observer, that each moment of experience is uh, uh, sort of united in a self that has those moments. Yeah? You with me so far? Uh, it's what's going on right now. We're all... Um, we have a solid, uh, natural sense that we are a, a unitary observer uh, observing a unitary field, um, both of which exist independently of each other. Um, what the Buddha is saying is that uh, although that, uh, that, that view uh, is... Um, effective from certain points of view uh, for certain objectives for the survival of the organism even for communication of the Dhamma uh, it cannot be uh, established in experience if you see what I mean you can never see like AJ Air jumping into the room you can never see the objective field without you experiencing it or you can never verify it in the same way, uh, the Buddha argues that you can never discover you independent of the moment of experience. And there are many Buddhist uh, practices, exercises, where you actually try to do that. You try to go looking for a self that exists independent of the moment of perception. And uh, believe me, I've done it for 45 years. You, you can't do it. You can never find any element within or without that uh, stands independent of the moment of, of experience. You just can't find it. Uh, you can think about this later. Uh, but the Buddha says that you can't find it. 
Later Buddhist tradition goes even even further than this and uh, argues that, or, or, well, it really builds on what the Buddha himself said. Uh, it argues that what you actually experience uh, is, is not reality. Um, and perhaps one could approach this from a, a more common sense point of view, um, from the, the common sense sort of neurophysiology of it. Um, we experience, um, you know, light coming, bouncing off an object, entering the... Uh, <laughs> my physiology is pretty ropey, <laughs> through the lens and onto the uh, retina at the back and then going through the optic nerve and uh, abracadabra, um, uh, there is a room full of you. Um, it's translated into an image, uh, uh, which is not a neurological signal. I don't experience a neurological signal. I don't experience light passing along the, the nerve. What I experience is uh, an, an appearance, uh, again, quoting the great Schopenhauer, a representation. Uh, it's not the thing itself. It's pretty radical. I, 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 I don't want to press it home too far because you might not be able to get home. Uh, um, it's pretty radical. If you start to really examine your experience, you realise that what you're experiencing is not objects, but a mental construction, a, a, uh, a, an image. Uh, it appears to be out there, but it can't be out there, even on common sense bases, if you see what I mean. Um, it may in some way be related to something out there, although even the notion of out there is part of the construction of uh, out there. You see what I mean? Um, but I can never, uh, uh, I can never experience what's out there, so to speak, independent of the process of uh, a neurological and psychological perception. What happens happens as an image, as a representation. Uh, what I uh, prefer to call an appearance phenomenon is, of course, simply means appearance. Why not use a good English word? An appearance. Uh, everything appears. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, like that, of course, with the, the external world. I've used the, the, uh, uh, um, the sense of sight. It's the same with all the other, other senses. Um, you can get very strong um, um, experiences of this with sound, I find. It's more difficult with sight because sight is uh, a much more concrete mode of experiencing, if you see what I mean. And it much more quickly uh, forms itself into a, a, a solid reality. Uh, with sound, you can, you can hear a sound and uh, you're not quite... If, 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 you don't, if you don't know what the sound is caused by, uh, you, you can have a definite sense that it's um, neither out there nor in here. This is one of the great benefits of tinnitus. Um, <laughs> I don't recommend it for other bases, but on a, on a long solitary retreat, I, I developed uh, quite acute tinnitus, uh, uh, what's it, not sinusitis, tinnitus. And uh, in meditation, it's, it's a very strange experience because it so definitely seems to be coming from somewhere. And yet you know it's not but it presents itself again and again and again as coming from somewhere. And hearing aids are very interesting from this point of view. That's why I wear them. I'm not really deaf. But because what's happening is the, um, the sound waves are being translated through um, you know, a chip into a, um, uh, um, you know, a, a, an electronically, electromagnetically amplified sound, if you see what I mean. But it's even one more remote from the, the, the original sound than the original sound is from uh, what it was originating. Um, very, very interesting in that way uh, with, when you begin to uh, break it down. And, and, and a lot of um, a particularly more abstract art is, is interested in this sort of um, uh, boundary between uh, external and internal 
um, a very strong experience with um, uh, the, the modernist, um, minimalist uh, music, uh, Reich. Um, I didn't really understand it, but a friend who, who knows these things took me and told me what to listen to. And you begin to experience uh, sounds emerging between notes. Um, you know, there, there'll be repeated patterns which are slightly off cycle and uh, they, they for a moment coincide and then they separate and your ear interprets the, sec the separation in terms of a third sound that emerges between them. And it's a very odd sensation because it's palpable, uh, audible, uh, and yet you know it's not there. It's a very odd experience. And a lot of uh, um, uh, uh, abstract painting, I think, is exploring this sort of uh, boundary um, and often defying your attempt to construct, uh, leaving you hanging in interpretive space, if you see what I mean. Um, so all our experience, all that we call our experience, is actually some sort of, we can say reconstruction, but of course even to say reconstruction is itself a reconstruction within the, 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 the view of reconstruction. I'm getting so clever this time. Do you see what I mean? That you, your, your, your experience is already a reconstruction, and then on the basis of your, uh, your, your reconstruction, you, uh, you uh, uh, translate it into, into abstractions, which reconstruct the reconstruction. Um, and, uh, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, that's what it is. <laughs> and, um, all our experience, in the end, is some kind of uh, a representation. Some kind, it's, a, it's an appearance. And uh, uh, the Buddha says that if you take that appearance and start to take it completely literally, uh, you get into trouble. Uh, because you're accepting literally the externality of the objective dimension of the moment of experience and you're uh, ex uh, taking literally the internality of the subjective element in the moment of experience and you're fixing them and then starting to wave them around and hit yourself and everybody else on the head with theories built upon them. And whilst a degree of theorising may be useful, it may uh, uh, create iPads and atom bombs and um, um, machines that make, um, um, uh, um, what do they call them, smoothies. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> why did that represent it? Um, um, you know, they, they sort of work in terms of getting to a talk and understanding what's going on and so forth. They don't do for understanding what ultimately reality is. Uh, they lead us astray. And they have to be used and held in a provisional as if sort of way. It's a let's look at it like this. It's all, you could say, a model. A model that we construct. But the big question is, using the, 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 the metaphor of, re of reconstruct, using the metaphor of model, a model of what? <laughs> uh, 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 this is the, the, the big question. I'm not going to deal with it today. I'll try and work out what the answer is and tell you tomorrow. Um, but that's what the, the question that's begged, isn't it? Because if, 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 if we try to understand our experience in terms of a representation, it's sort of already suggests in the abstractions that we're using something that is represented. Uh, if we talk about reconstruction, something that's constructed, uh, something that's fabricated. Uh, but what? Um, and uh, this, of course, is part of where the Buddha is taking us when he refuses to answer the, what are called, the avyakrata, uh, the, the unanswerable questions. Um, but I, I want to look a little bit more at uh, what this appearance is. 
we've, we've looked at it, uh, well, I've looked at it in terms of, of a representation that uh, um, kind of naturally presents itself to, in t to us in terms of a, an independent objective reality and an independent subjective uh, perceiver. It, it, uh, the original disposition of the mind, the way it happens, the way we learn as babies to uh, parse the world, to construct the world, is as something definitely in here uh, experiencing something definitely out there, both of which are independent. And uh, um, sub, vo sub voce, un under the breath, uh, permanent and real, um, as uh, abiding, as enduring. We think of uh, the internal dimension of experience as existing independent of the moment of experience and uh, permanently so. So we think of experience happening to something that doesn't change. We think that the, the externals change to some extent, what philosophers call the accidents. Um, uh, you know, I'm definitely different to how I was uh, 60 plus years ago. Um, uh, well, I was going to say I had more hair, had more hair then, but of course I didn't to begin with. Um, uh, but even if you if you trace the progress of my hair, um, you can see that all the accidents have changed hugely. They started with none, little fuzz, and I had lovely blonde curls when I was a little boy. I've got photos of me. Oh, so sweet. And then gradually it went sort of mousy, and, um, uh, and then it went really long in the 60s, um, really dirty and tangled. Um, and then uh, it got uh, shorter, and then it began mysteriously to disappear again. As second childhood got closer and closer, I approached the uh, physical form of it. Um, so definitely, you know, I know when I look at that picture of that little boy standing there in a, a, such a characteristically subotine pose, um, um, but um, identifiably somehow connected with me, um, as if I know exactly what everything is uh, um, and where it should be, even though tomorrow I'll think something different. Um, um, and it ought, should be the way I think it is. Uh, stop. It's um, uh, but it's definitely a different, different, different sort of accident. But I think of that as being me. I think of uh, uh, that, that I somehow have remained all the way through. I don't think about it very much, but I somehow think that I've always been without really thinking about it. Because I don't have any experience, like poor old Ayer in the, the darkened room, I don't have any experience of not being, because it's not an experience that you can have. And um, when I, when I uh, uh, you know, I think of after death, it's, it's not really easy, it's not possible to think of, of life after I'm not in it. Because even when I think of life and I'm not in it, I'm thinking of it as me experiencing life with not me in it. So that in the background, the inevitable background of my construction of my experience, my representation of my experience, is an assumption of an enduring me. And it's an enduring me that is independent of the moment of experience. Um, it's somehow... Uh, owns experience, it somehow has experience, but it's somehow unchanged by experience. Of course, we will say, oh, I've changed, and so forth. And, uh, uh, and we recognise that at a, at a superficial level, at a, or even quite a deep level, at the psychological and even maybe spiritual level. But somehow lurking at the back of it is an assumption of something unchanging. Um, it's hard to catch. We also consider that that... Uh, uh, that self that uh, we read into, we have to read into our experience in order to have the experience, uh, it, uh, 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 the, um, uh, Kant called it the transcendental unity of apperception, the, the, that outside the moment of experience, uh, there's uh, something transcendental in the sense of being outside the moment of experience, which has the experience as a unity, do you see what I mean? That sees it as one. And that is a unity. Uh, the, the, uh, the perceiver is a unity. Um, we have to do that. And we think of that uh, self that has experience, 
as uh, sort of the the generator of itself. Um, uh, the, the Buddhist term is uh, author of itself uh, or uh, self-created, um, existing from its own side, making itself, so to speak. Um, so this is a, a necessary delusion, if you like, uh, simply to have experience. And uh, um, uh, it, uh, mutatis mutandis, changing that which needs to be changed, it applies to everything outside. We assume that it exists uh, permanently, we ex it's assume that it exists independently, and we assume that it exists from its own side. And that somehow experience is the meeting of these two. Um, but uh, uh, we cannot actually discover either the independent object or the independent subject. If we go into an inquiry, if we look closely at our experience, we cannot find either. And I invite you to uh, do some homework on, your, on, the, on the way back. Uh, be careful when you're crossing roads. Um, uh, you know, pr probably best to take the external reality of the road and the cars on it uh, for granted for the time being. Uh, and the solidity of your own reality for granted. But uh, just sort of start to investigate. Um, well, is, it, is what I've said true? It, is there an assumption of an independent unitary self, uh, which is uh, the author of itself? Is there an assumption of an independent uh, a unitary field of experience that is uh, independent and um, self self sort of generated coming from its own side is that there can you find it so interesting even just to ask how would you find it if you wanted to find it um well we've only got limited tools we've got senses and we've got reason at least for the time being uh, we might find some more later but um just go looking see what you can find in in either of these cases um and uh, uh it'd be very interesting to see where we uh, come to tomorrow. I haven't left time for questions, as usual. Um, but I hope you've got a sort of an idea of the, the trajectory that we're on. Um, we're uh, trying to understand why the Buddha refused to answer these questions. And hopefully, we'll come to not an answer to these questions, but to uh, a more positive content for them. Something that's more... Uh, I won't say intellectually satisfying, but spiritually satisfying, if you like. Um, I hope you've understood why, at least I'm asserting, um, on behalf of the Buddha, why he couldn't answer those questions. Because they're abstractions from experience that have no independent reality of their own. I hope you've understood that uh, experience itself is already a construction. Uh, it's a construction... Uh, um, which presents itself to you as an appearance. But that appearance, which presents itself to you as being an external and internal reality, is just an appearance. What it's an appearance of, uh, we'll try and uh, investigate tomorrow. Um, uh, we'll try and arrive at an intelligible understanding of what uh, that um, uh, reality may be, if there is such a reality, independent of the, of, uh, of, the, um, of the appearance. Maybe there isn't one. Maybe there is one. Let's try to find out tomorrow. And in the meantime, please, if you can, um, take moments when you're safe and uh, um, uh, um, uh, you know, reasonably quiet and uh, just look at what's happening and try to maybe just sort of think it's an appearance and try to see what that actually might mean. Investigate the, uh, the suggestion that what you experience is appearance, not thing. What it is uh, experiencing is an appearance, not a self. Just investigate that. And, uh, you know, sitting on the tube and... Uh, 
uh, just for a moment, just relax and uh, sort of watch what's going on, what's happening. Uh, what is this uh, experience? What is appearing? What does that appearance signify? What is the reality in that experience? And uh, let's see where we go tomorrow. I hope that I'll begin to uh, push a little bit beyond appearance, uh, although it's impossible. Um, but at least give us a sort of uh, um, aesthetically and spiritually satisfying way of, of uh, beginning to do so. And uh, I'll try and leave some time for questions. I'm not very good at that. Somebody will have to um, show me a war, an ending, a finitude. Uh, and we'll take it from there.